Greetings, friends, fellow Earthlings, and maybe, like me, some other people out there who are going to hold your breaths in the upcoming launch of JWST very soon. Welcome to Ask an Astrobiologist, the show that celebrates the science and celebrates the scientist involved in our quest to understand the nature of life in our universe. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Lau, also known online as The Cosmo Biologist, and we're brought to you by the NASA Astrobiology Program and SeganNet.org. We also want to give a huge thanks to all of you out there in the, the interwebs who keep sharing about our show and interacting and engaging with our guests and fellow audience members uh, engaging in this quest of understanding life. We want to give a special shout out this month to Aranavo Padar, uh, who is an undergraduate student in biotechnology at SRM University in India. So Aranava, uh, thank you very much for sharing about hashtag Ask Astrobio. Now, I'm old enough that I remember a time when we had no evidence at all for worlds to exist around other stars. But since the early 1990s, we've been detecting these exoplanets, these extrasolar worlds out there. We now have detections confirmed of over 4,500 of these worlds that we've detected through space telescopes like Kepler and like TESS, and we'll be doing using the, the upcoming JWST to explore even more of these worlds and maybe even get better data about their atmospheres and whether or not they could potentially be habitable worlds. And so for this episode, we wanted to bring in an expert in exoplanets using telescopes to study them in astrophysics and astrobiology. And so we brought onto the show Dr. Natalie Battaglia. Dr. Battaglia is a professor of astronomy and astrophysics at UC Santa Cruz, specializing in detection and characterization of exoplanets. She was previously a research astronomer at NASA's Ames Research Center and held the positions of co-investigator and Kepler mission scientist on the Kepler mission, which was the first mission capable of finding Earth-sized planets around other stars. Dr. Battaglia now uses the world's most powerful ground-based telescopes to identify the planets that we'll be exploring more with the upcoming JWST. And she has also previously been named by Time Magazine as one of the world's 100 most influential people in 2017. Uh, Dr. Battaglia, thank you for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Hi, Graham. Thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be here. I'm so glad we could have you on. I've actually wanted you on the show for some time now, um, so I'm so glad you could join us. Um, what I love to do with our, 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 our guests when they first join us is to ask them about their, their science origin story. What really got them into a career, a pathway that took them into astrobiology? I wonder if you could share with us, what was the inspiration for you to pursue the career that you now have in, in astrophysics and astronomy? Oh, goodness. That's such a complicated question because our our lives take various turns and, and go down different pathways and we don't really understand always why. Um, I, I wasn't initially interested in science as a youth. Uh, it wasn't on my mind at all. I started college as a business major and um, it wasn't until kind of my, the middle of my undergrad that I took a physics class and was just blown away by it. I, and people often ask me, what inspired you to take that physics class? And um, that's a complicated question, but I think a lot of it has to do with the space shuttle program, which was the backdrop of the 1980s when I was in high school and, and, and also in college in the latter half of the 80s. Um, the space program just seemed like the coolest job you could have. Um, and when I saw Sally Ride go into space and also met uh, Ray Seddon, a former astronaut uh, who was a Berkeley alum, and I met her when I was an undergrad, it, you know, all of a sudden I could see myself being involved in some capacity. I still didn't want to be a scientist. When I took my first internship, I told my research advisor that I wasn't like the other kids. I wasn't going to do science. I thought maybe I would somehow bridge business and science in some way. And I didn't know that this idea of a project manager even existed at the time. Um, but he gave me a problem to solve and it introduced me to really what science is all about you know, the scientific method, this, um, the feeling of discovery, of wonder, and even of, of beauty, you know, being able to see that what I was interested in, or the beauty that I saw and uh, was enhanced by being able to explain it and understand it. 
the idea that understanding is a sort of um, ecstasy, I think Carl Sagan said, or euphoria. Uh, just put all the puzzle pieces together for me. And, and so that's how my career started. That's fantastic. Yeah, and I think for a lot of us who've come to the sciences, you know, you're right. We have many pathways to get to where we are, but there is that that joy, you know, the exploration and the power of explanation of what we're learning. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't know of exoplanets. And now a, a great portion of the human population have been born into a time when exoplanets we know they, they exist and that we've confirmed their detections. Uh, I wonder, can you give us kind of, you know, from your perspective, what does it mean for us now as a species, as a biosphere, that, that we know that exoplanets exist? And, and what is your, your side of the research in looking into exoplanets? When I started research, there were no known exoplanets. Um, most of us in those days started out as stellar astrophysicists. We were studying the stars. That was helpful because the way that we were discovering planets was to observe something about the star that inferred the existence of the planet. So that was my pathway to exoplanets. I was actually at the conference in Florence, Italy, where Michelle Mayor announced the first exoplanet. Um, and so I feel like I've had a front row seat to this new field being born and then also becoming part of it and, and, you know, not just observing from the sidelines, but being enmeshed in it and understanding that feeling of discovering a new world and what that means starting out as an abstraction. But as you learn more, it becomes more, less of an, an abstraction and more of a, an actual physical place that you can imagine. You can use your empathy to actually place yourself there and, and, and imagine what it might be like. Um, so, you know, as that unfolds, and as humans learn more, it seeds, the knowledge seeds itself into the our public consciousness, our collective consciousness. And it subtly, slowly transforms how we see ourselves in the universe as part of the universe, as, as part of a living world, not separate from that planet, but part of it. And I have certainly observed that happening with me, and I've seen it happen with the people I talk to as well. Um, one of the most marked moments was after Kepler launched, and we had already discovered hundreds of planets, and we were, we were using that information to deduce how many planets are therefore in the galaxy as a whole. And one of the early results that I kept seeing over and over and pro probably didn't even appreciate it at the time, was that the average number of planets per star is greater than one. And so as I look at the sky now, I see the sky differently with that knowledge. Now I know that these stars are not just stars, but planetary systems. Um, and so it's a subtle thing. You don't realize how much it impacts us as a species. Um, but now the narrative has changed so much. Now that Kepler has finished, it catalyzed the search for life. You can't help but know, knowing that the nearest potentially habitable planet is likely to be within 10 light years, that there are literally billions of potentially habitable worlds in our galaxy alone, you can't help but wonder how many living worlds are out there. So now we are just hyper-focused and driven by this singular question and everything we're doing um, is just a waypoint towards that broader goal. Yeah, I love that vision too. You know, like looking at the nighttime sky when I was a kid, you know, I saw these dots of light and and now we can envision them as, you know, systems and stars with planets and maybe asteroids and comets of their own and maybe even biospheres in some of those worlds. That's rather remarkable. Um, some years ago, I was taking a graduate course at CU Boulder, uh, and Nick Schneider was, was one of the professors. And, and I remember Nick said this really funny thing that like, everything we thought we knew about planets changed once we started finding exoplanets, and that that keeps changing. Um, I wonder, is there anything that you think uh, is changing right now in our understanding of worlds around stars because of all these detections of exoplanets? Uh, absolutely. I mean, you go back to the very first planet discovery, that hot Jupiter 51 Peg B was already a, a huge surprise. And we are still reeling from it. We think we have a decent explanation, but we don't have concrete proof that our explanation is correct. Uh, that will in part be tested by Webb in the future, how a giant planet can form 10 times closer to its star than Mercury is to our sun, for example. Um, so the, the entire field has been 
fil filled with surprises. Um, the most common type of planet that we know of so far in the galaxy is a kind of planet that we don't have in our own solar system where you have the small terrestrials orbiting close to the star and the large gas giants orbiting far away with nothing really in between in terms of size, tiny versus large. And yet in the galaxy, again, the most common type of planet orbiting within one astronomical unit is these this mysterious in-between planet. Are they scaled up Earths? Does that represent more real estate for life? Or are they the stripped cores of Neptunes, former Neptunes? And if so, what are the implications for the evolution of life on such a world? So, so many questions have been opened up. Um, and, and again, we hope to answer some of these with Webb. Um, but we've also learned from Kepler that the diversity of planets in the galaxy is staggering. You know, that's just one example of a kind of planet we don't have in our own solar system, but there are many others. There are lava worlds with oceans the size of the Pacific of, of molten rock. There are planets orbiting not one star, but two. There are planets the age of the galaxy itself, which we didn't think was possible because we didn't think the raw materials would exist that early on. So, I mean, the, the list is endless. So there are endless horizons to explore, which is very exciting. Absolutely. And I love that, you know, I think people hear about us detecting exoplanets, but they're unaware that most of them are, are very close to our own solar system in the galaxy. We found some, you know, more towards the galaxy center, but there's still so much more galaxy to explore yet and, and so much more possibility. And, and Kepler really brought the, the explosion in our knowledge of the number of likely worlds out there. Uh, a lot of our audience members are younger people, maybe high school students, college students, recent graduates. I know a lot of them want to be astrobiologists themselves and, and maybe even want to be involved as mission scientists one day. Uh, I wonder, could you just, you know, kind of explain for them what the pathway was for you to become a co-investigator on a mission um, and what that's like for your career to kind of, you know, go along with a mission through its development into launch and then making these incredible discoveries like Kepler did? Yeah. I mean, it all starts with that seed that is sprouting within you, which is your passion, what you what you want to do, what you love, you know, per pursue what you love, and the rest follows. And, you know, maybe I wouldn't have, I mean, working on Kepler was so lucky being in the right, to some degree in the right place at the right time. How did I get there? <laughs> I, I was working as a postdoc in Brazil at the time, so I'm living in the middle of Tijuca Forest in a, <laughs> in a subtropical rainforest and uh, doing my thing there. I was studying young so sun-like stars, baby suns, essentially. And um, I learned about a fellow who was proposing a new technique to find planets using what was called the transit method, looking for brightness variations when a planet eclipses a star in its orbit. And I was studying spots, magnetic activity, which produces star spots and um, on young suns. And I knew that an Earth is tinier <laughs> in projection than a typical star spot. And star spots rotate in and out of view as the star spins. So I wrote this just kind of cold turkey, wrote an email to this gentleman at NASA Ames, whose name was William Baruki, and said, I'm intrigued by this methodology, but here's why I'm skeptical. Um, and I've been studying star spots, and, and so this is why. And, and he responded almost immediately and, and said, actually, that was one of the reasons why our last proposal was rejected, because Ed Weiler, who was a stellar astrophysicist at the time and working at NASA headquarters and leading the Discovery Program, had that, that same skepticism. So he invited me to come to NASA Ames and work on the problem. And, and basically what we showed was that, yes, for some fraction of stars, you won't be able to tell the difference between a, a transiting Earth and a star spot run, rotating in and out of view. Um, that only happens when the stars are rapidly rotating, and there are other ways to discern. Um, but then you can do a population synthesis model and say, okay, what fraction of the stars that we're observing will have that problem? And it turned out to be a relatively small fraction. So as long as we observed enough stars, it wouldn't hurt us. Um, so I, I don't know, my, my advice to young people is um, 
again, just do what you love and you will find a way to express that if, you know, hopefully you will find a way to express that. And I was very lucky. I had no guarantee that Kepler would get selected. Um, it did. And it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe that that had happened. I still didn't know quite what it meant for me in terms of finding a long term employment, you know, to support my family and, and all of that. So um, I was very lucky. But if Kepler hadn't come along, I would have, uh, you know, found a different pathway and, and hopefully a way to also express these passions and, and what I love and what I think is important. You know, I love, though, that, you know, your first connection what was the potential for issues with the, tra- the detection through the transit method. I, I love that that was the connection, you know, that, you know, in, in science, we need a, a healthy bit of skepticism and, and we need to consider all the possible issues that come up and how we apply our techniques. And, and so I, I love that that's also part of your route into then being involved in Kepler, which was such a powerful mission. Um, we've since had, we, we've certainly had tests, or we have tests. Um, we've done a lot of work from ground-based telescopes now. But I wonder uh, for our audience, since, you know, JWST is coming up very soon, it will launch uh, no earlier than the 24th of December, but we'll have a launch here soon and then roughly a month uh, for the process of deployment of the telescope. Um, But then soon, hopefully, we'll have JWST looking at exoplanets. Uh, Would you mind explaining for our audience what's so important or powerful about this new telescope when it comes to understanding those alien worlds? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so Webb, you know, what, what, what is a telescope good for? Well, telescopes are light buckets. They collect photons and the bigger the bucket, the more photons you collect. So first and foremost, Webb is a huge light bucket and that allows us to see either fainter things or to see further, which is also fainter, right? Exoplanets are close, the ones that we're studying, but they're very faint. They're very hard to detect. So having that big bucket helps us. Um, Having a big bucket also means that you can see finer detail. So if you're interested in directly imaging the environs around a star, that's really important. Webb is Thirdly, Webb is an infrared telescope, and there's a huge payoff for observing exoplanets in the infrared because, you know, there's this 10 billion to one brightness contrast between a star like the sun and a tiny planet like Earth. Um, That brightness contrast gets a little lesser, maybe a million to one. If you go to the infrared, planets become brighter, stars become fainter, and that helps you. So um, also in the infrared, there are many chemical fingerprints of molecules from like greenhouse gases in atmospheres that we care about for planets. And so working in the infrared is the third thing. Um, Infrared is just another color on the electromagnetic spectrum, just beyond the red part that our eyes can see. Um, Our eyes cannot see infrared, but we can build instruments that can. Um, And so the fourth thing that Webb does that people might not appreciate, um, it's really built to be a spectroscopic instrument or telescope. Um, A lot of what we do in astronomy is spectroscopic. And um, I've been forbidden to say that word in some interviews. um, But basically what spectroscopy is, is the study of colors. It's catching light and spreading it out into a rainbow. When you look at that rainbow in great detail, you see the chemical fingerprints of molecules and atoms that are in atmospheres or nebulae or, you know, whatever it is you're studying or a planet's atmosphere in this case. So, um, you know, Hubble, people are used to seeing all these amazing images from Hubble and Webb will produce images too. But I truly think that Webb's greatest legacy is going to be in spectroscopy. And certainly for exoplanets, that rings true. And so a lot of what Webb will do is observe these planets that, are, again, are transiting in front of the star. In that very special geometry, some of the starlight is going to filter through the atmosphere you know, that the planet is hugging um, on, on its limb. And so that atmosphere will impart its chemical fingerprints onto the light and will catch it, spread it out, disentangle the star from the planet. And through this way, we will see what chemical constituents are in the planet's atmosphere atmosphere, maybe even map out the temperature pressure profile as a function of altitude and all of this information combined in the best scenario could even give us some information about the surface conditions of a planet that's potentially habitable, like the planets orbiting the very famous TRAPPIST-1, which is a 
star that's about a very cool M type star that's only about 40 light years away that has seven planets known to be orbiting it, three of which are in the Goldilocks zone. So that is one of the first things that will be studied with Webb. Um, but Webb was not built to be a life finder. Web, with Webb, we're going to study the atmospheres and have a new lens on planet diversity that will teach us about the physical processes that yield that diversity. We, we need to understand those physical processes before we can understand uh, the most likely abodes of life. So, so Webb is this way station towards a life detection. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it feels to me like another massive step along our way of learning too, you know, from, from our earliest use of pointing a telescope to the heavens to start understanding other worlds and stars to things like Kepler and then JWST and then other upcoming telescopes like Nancy Grace Roman Telescope. And, and now we might have something kind of like a Lavoir style telescope in the coming decade, decade and a half. And so there, there's so much that we're, we're progressing along the way. And, and I love, too, for our audience that you share, you know, that, that there's that little bit of light that's going through the atmosphere and coming to us. Um, you know, it's, it's such a small amount that we're actually getting. And still we can learn so much about those possible alien worlds out there. And I, I think in some way that also just, it almost makes it feel magical. I think for some of us, you know, that, that we're, we're learning so much right now about our place in the universe through things like Kepler and JWST. And so I want to change just a little bit before we open it up to our audience questions here. Uh, you before have, have, uh, have spoken, um, have done spoken word, uh, reading famous poems and poems that mean a lot to you uh, in the universe in verse, uh, an event that highlights the connections of our understanding through science and our understanding of ourselves through poetry, through the written word. And, and so I, I love that you kind of have this connection as well to poetry and, and to art. I wonder, um, for our audience, can you, you know, kind of describe to us the importance in your life for poetry and for art and its meaning for you and, and how you found it so meaningful in the science that you do? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned the universe in verse, um, universe in verse, like poetry. That's the brainchild of Maria Popova, who writes uh, the blog Brain Pickings. Well, she's an author as well. Um, but and Brain Pickings is now called the Marginalian, so you can find her there. She's a luminary, um, very interested in history, in philosophy, in art, and and astronomy. And so she's the one that has connected uh, science and poetry in a very visceral way um, that I I love. Um, poetry came late to me. Uh, it's another thing, like science, I did not relate to science when I was a youngster because I didn't understand what the scientific method was. I thought it was very sterile. In the same way, I didn't really understand poetry when I was young. None of it that was presented to me as a child resonated with me. Poetry is very personal. It wasn't until I read Mary Oliver around the time of the Kepler launch, actually. Um, I discovered Mary Oliver, in particular, a poem that she wrote called Swan. And Kepler was observing Cygnus the Swan, or stars in the Cygnus part of the galaxy. And I really thought when I read that poem that she was maybe even talking about Cygnus the constellation flying through the Milky Way. Um, but, but, but her poem is just the imagery of a swan on a dark river at night and, and watching it take off. And, you know, all of her poems are very ingrained in nature. She's kind of the female Walt Whitman and um, very simple language, but very profound. And she describes this swan and, and the sound that it makes and so beautifully. And, and the very last sentence of the poem, after she gives this description, she says, so, and have you changed your life, you know, as, as a result of this beauty and seeing that beauty and, and internalizing it, you know, what did you do? Did you change your life? And, and, and the answer is yes. I mean, absolutely. You know, for, for me, I couldn't get interested in science until I could connect the wonder of it all. And, and poetry did that for me. Um, and then I also just want to, in fact, I brought the book thinking that you might ask about poetry. Um, Diane Ackerman is one of my favorite poets. This is a collection called Jaguar of Sweet Laughter. She was a student at Cornell when Carl Sagan was there, and she wrote a book of poems inspired by the solar system. Um, and and uh, I, 
she's a genius. Um, it's very beautiful. I can read to you. Can I read to you one excerpt? Absolutely. Yeah, please, please do. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, really beautiful. She even has a poem in here called an ode to an alien, uh, <laughs> which is very appropriate. But this particular poem, just because we were talking about the wonder and science, um, this is a poem called Pluto, actually. Um, and I'm just going to read you one tiny excerpt. Those whom the darts of wonder never fret may think it odd that on a vapory midday in July, a young woman might take to the stars. I'll just stop there. I mean, it's just a few lines, but it, but it's, it's this idea that um, wonder and science are connected and that you can't have curiosity about the natural world without feeling that, that sense of wonder. So this book really resonates with me. It's very beautiful. Well, I will have to get the book first. Um, that was lovely. And, and I love, I love, you know, when we can use our language in so many ways to explain what it means to be human right now in the cosmos. I, that's a really good point. I, and I, I want to make that re- repeat what you just said, um, because it's so important. I think that, um, you know, coming to UC Santa Cruz, where I'm a professor of astrophysics and the director of astrobiology here, um, I wanted to make sure that we were communicating scientific discovery to the public so science communications is very strong here at the university, but I really think that communicating scientific discovery through the arts, be it poetry or visual arts or music even, is another way of communicating discovery that we often neglect. And I think that that's so tremendously important. So, um, I, I hope that we will host the universe inverse here one day at UC Santa Cruz for that reason. Oh, that'd be so lovely. I, I hope so. Hopefully Maria will hear this and, and, and want to do that as well. Um, and I actually just had a very interesting uh, semi-conversation. It wasn't very long uh, last night on Twitter with a poet named Jared Anderson. Uh, he also hosts the podcast, The Crypto Naturalist. And we were discussing, um, you know, specializing in science or poetry and then also, you know, how scientists can also express themselves through art in various ways. And artists can certainly think scientifically can, and can approach things scientifically. But Jared did make an interesting argument that our granting agencies, our funding agencies, should provide some funding to hire poets and to hire artists. I just, I wonder, you know, what, what is your take on that? Should we also bring in those who have a different perspective, perhaps, of sharing the language into our grants? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great point. Um, you know, we're, we, I, I feel like we're doing science on a shoestring budget to, to large degree, you know, the selection rates for fellowships and for research grants is like 10%. So, um, it's very difficult. We're trying to do the most we can with the minimal, you know, with the fewest resources. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. So, um, but but yes, I, I absolutely agree. You know, send a poet, or they should have sent a poet. I mean, yes, it is such a vital part of how we communicate, um, and it's it's growing. I don't know where these young people are getting resources to do this, but look at Trace, Tracy K. Smith, who's now our poet laureate. Um, she wrote a poem about the Hubble Space Telescope. Her father was an engineer on the telescope, and. Um, and she was inspired on, about that. So I'm wondering what youngsters are out there today inspired by Webb who might write poetry or see the poetry in it. I mean, even our science communicators, Natalie Walklover wrote a wonderful article for Quanta magazine where she likened uh, Webb to a lotus, a golden lotus blooming on a silver leaf. I mean, the lyricism of that and the image that it invokes and is is quite remarkable. So Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a lot to Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm loving this conversation so much, but part of our show is to open up uh, the questions to our audience to allow them to ask you as the astrobiologist uh, questions about your research, about topics we've discussed so far, about JWST and more. And our first question comes from a longtime viewer of the show uh, and uh, the leader of the Astro Sociology Research Institute, Dr. Jim Pass. Uh, Dr. Pass says that astronomy education consists of scientific discoveries, of course, 
but also involves the biographies of influential astronomers through the ages, how can the social sciences add increased depth to the human dimension of astronomical knowledge? Oh, goodness, that's such a good question. Um, it's hard for me to see the forest through the trees. This is another thing that we're doing in the astrobiology program here. We're, we've collaborated with our humanists um, to talk about the societal impacts and also the ethics of space sciences. We have a weekly ethics reading group. Um, and so this issue about um, the sociology of it comes up frequently. Um, I'm very intrigued in part reading Maria Popova's work because she dives into history so much and has really shined a, a, a spotlight on some of the luminaries of the past. Mariah Mitchell, for example, um, Cecilia Payne, you know, Rachel Somerville, there, there, there's so many different, um, scientists of the past that have been overlooked, uh, people like uh, William and Mary Huggins, who observed the chemical fingerprints of the first stars and showed that they were very much like the sun, whose chemical fingerprints we share here on Earth, showing how everything is connected. And of course, Cecilia Payne, who then took that information and showed that the universe is mostly hydrogen and that we are made of stardust. I mean, all of this kind of connected chain of human knowledge is I mean, that's what it is to be human. Uh, as a scientist, I know that I'm going to end my life with more questions left unanswered than answered. I take solace in that, knowing that my daughter is also an astrophysicist. But so there it's more direct, the connection, the generational continuation, continuity of human knowledge. Um, but, but also I see that through my students and knowing that it will carry on somehow gives me solace. Um, that's not a direct que uh, answer to his question, but I, I do think that it's very important to kind of, um, I, I mean, we, we are humans doing science and you can't escape the fact that we are humans. We're kind of embedded in it and part of it, we're trying to disentangle something that is also ourselves and we're part of it. So um, I think it's helpful to have the humanists and philosophers, sociologists, kind of observing from the outside and also helping us to figure out and guide us, give us an ethical framework, um, especially with planet hunting. Hunting, they use this word hunting. I'm really trying to be purposeful about that, uh, getting away from the colonial language that we use when we talk about other planets because if we do find a living world, by definition, it's not ours for the taking. And yet people are talking about planet B and, you know, as if we need a backup plan and could we go there and when can I pack my, you know, can I pack my bags? When can I go? Um, that's not what it's about either. So having these conversations with the, with the humanists has been very, very helpful. That's lovely. Yeah, it's so important to connect in that way. And I hadn't even thought of that myself in that connection with hunting for exoplanets and potential issues in, in that, that terminology, the language that we use um, when explaining the science that we're doing. Um, if I can, so uh, a question came in from Reddit from Beck Beliefs, uh, user Beck Beliefs. Uh, Beck Beliefs wants to know how JWST will cooperate with other space and ground-based observatories uh, to do follow-up investigations on exoplanets. I mean, we're doing that already, and Webb hasn't even launched. Um, as you, you mentioned this in the introduction, that I'm utilizing ground-based telescopes. Um, so what we're doing is we, we've identified planets that are nearby and that are perfect candidates for being s subjected to atmospheric characterization with Webb. Um, but in order to disambiguate the atmospheric properties you, you need to know something about the planet that you're looking at. Um, and so it's very helpful if you can know both radius and the mass that gives you together those two properties, tell us what the surface gravity is likely to be. If the surface gravity is really high, it will compress the atmosphere. If the surface gravity is really low, the atmosphere will be more lofted. So that's important to know in order to interpret the atmospheric properties. So with Space missions like TESS and Kepler that measure these dimmings of light due to transits, you get the radius of the planet. 
but it's only with these large ground-based telescopes like Keck that we can measure the Doppler wobble, which tells us the mass. So we've been spending a lot of time now for two years observing the best targets uh, from TESS that were identified mostly from TESS, um, whose planets can be subjected to atmospheric characterization with Webb. So that's one example of the kind of synergy between space telescopes and ground-based telescopes. That's fantastic. Um, a question just came in from Jeff Neal on YouTube. Um, one, Jeff, Jeff says that, that he's appreciated the background that we've given so far. Um, uh, oh, sorry, he loves the background behind you. Oh, sorry. Um, Jeff, Jeff wants to know if that's a Kepler 10B globe or a Kepler 22B uh, throw pillow. It is, it is not a Kepler 10B globe. It is the Kepler 10B <laughs> globe. I think it's the only one in existence. Um, and it was painted um, by Dana Berry, who did the 3D rendering of the surface of Kepler 10B um, after or when it was discovered. And, and we went to communicate that to the public. And he used that artistry for his own documentary, which was called, uh, gosh, Finding the Next Earth, I think it was. I think it's had a couple of generations, a couple of different names. Um, and then, yes, you see my round water world pillow on my <laughs> on my couch. <laughs> I love it. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, I, th I think amongst us scientists and space nerds, we have lots of gear <laughs> around our favorite pursuits. You know, for me, I have lots of meteorites and rocks being a geologist in my office. Um, a question came in from Indrajit Laha on, on YouTube. Uh, Indrajit wants to know, um, they want to be involved in the human exploration of the moon and Mars. And so their question is, uh, if they want to be an astrobiologist exploring the moon and Mars, uh, what kinds of science do you think they should pursue? Astrobiology is inherently in interdisciplinary. So we, in order to understand the most likely abodes of life, in order to understand the origin and the distribution of life and its evolution in in the cosmos, um, you do astronomy, so you can find these cosmic objects. You have to do planetary sciences because you need to understand their geology and how planets are can be diverse and in what ways. You have to be an Earth scientist as well because we need to, you know, Earth is the only place where we have life and we can observe how the interior or geology of a planet interacts with the atmosphere and the biosphere in between how those elements co-evolve with time not just over hundreds of years but over deep time going all the way back to the beginning of earth when microbes ruled the land i guess microbes still rule the land <laughs> but um, back then that's all we had and so we want to understand that whole geological picture going back in deep time. Um, so, and then of course you've got the life sciences. You've got biochemistry. You know the rise of molecular complexity. We see, we observe amino acids, some amino acids in space in the interstellar medium, nu nucleic um, nucleobases. You know, these building blocks of life are out in the cosmos, but how do they self assemble? How do you create? RNA, for example, you know, the, the enzymes that are used. I mean, this is a subject of, you know, this this early biochemistry and, and how the original building blocks came to be is you have to understand that. Um, we want to know how a single-celled microbe evolved after two billion years on planet Earth once oxygen was released into the atmosphere in great quantities, um, single-celled life evolved into multi-celled life, and the eukaryote came to be, and that's what created the tree of branch of the tree of life that led to us and, and you know, intelligence, what we think of as intelligence, at least. So all, all of these things are necessary to understand. So you could really study anything in the sciences, um, and as we discussed, you could even study, be a humanist and be part of it. Um, again, it's just really to find what you love and what interests you, and then to find the pathways that kind of make all of these elements diverge into what you're passionate about. That's Absolutely. It's like uh, Mary Wojtek often said, everyone can be an astrobiologist. 
Um, we have another question on YouTube from T. Vinant Reddy, uh, and he would like to know if we find a planet that appears to have life, um, and we would assume uh, um, perhaps non-intelligent life if we're not finding signs of technosignatures, um, if that world is so far away that we can't go say hi, um, what more do you think we would do once we had a detection or a potential detection, I think is the better language, um, of life on the planet? I don't think that the that finding evidence of life is going to be a singular aha moment, like, ah, we have it. I think it's going to be very gradual. We're going to build up that evidence. We're going to confirm it. We're going to look at it in different ways. We're going to rule out other scenarios. This is exactly how exoplanet discovery was done. You know, you see a signal, it looks like an exoplanet, but there are myriad other ways of creating that same signal through just normal astrophysics. And you have to weed out all of the astrophysical false positives to be certain that what you're seeing is a planet. So that very careful work will be um, also applied to finding evidence of life beyond Earth, and it will it'll be this gradual process. And And I think initially... We will see a group, maybe we'll do a statistical sample, observations of many potentially habitable planets. We'll understand their surface conditions. Maybe we'll find an oxygen signal. We'll weed out other potential false positives. Maybe there will be a subset of planets that stand out in some way as being very different from most of the other planets that could be indicative of some disequilibrium chemistry happening on the surface that we think is life. And we will study them. We'll study them in more detail. Um, I could even imagine instruments that we put into space beyond Web beyond Roman, beyond Louvoir, we eventually want to put a network of interferometers in space that could resolve the surfaces of planets and actually see the reflectant signature of large forests or microbial mats or wh- whatever they are that exists there. Um, so that will be a process that stretches generations and generations into the future. Will we eventually go there? I think that once we can point to stars that we know have living worlds, it's going to really motivate humans around the globe to work towards that goal Um, just because you you can't help but want to reach out um, or know more, connect in some way. I mean, that's also part of what makes us human. So um, whether or not that'll ever happen, I, I don't know. I do know that Earth has a finite lifetime, so eventually we'll have to get off this planet. It's probably sooner than we think. So uh, it'd be good to have that capability eventually, but it'll be a slow process. Absolutely. Um, and for, for myself, so we have many more questions. I, I promise our audience I'll try my hardest to get to all of them I can. Um, I do want to know, though, so, um, you know, so – what your opinion then is on concepts like METI, messaging extraterrestrial intelligence, um, sending messages out there intentionally right now. If we find a world that appears to potentially have life, should we, ought we to send a message towards it? Or do we owe it perhaps to ourselves to first consider, you know, who speaks for Earth? And is it an existential threat for us to try to speak to some, someone else out there right now? Um, I, I don't know that it's an existent, existential threat. I personally don't hold that view, but um, I could be naive. And I, I also don't feel um, compelled to send messages out, although there is something interesting about this idea of a message in a bottle. You know, we did put a message on Pioneer. We did put a message on the Voyager spacecraft. Why do we feel compelled to do that? It's kind of like uh, writing graffiti on a wall, you know, we were here, I exist. Um, so it's, it's probably more of an uh, philosophical existential reasons for doing so, for communicating, not necessarily intentionally trying to signal, you know, we're, we're here, is anybody out there? Um, should we do that? I don't feel compelled to right now. Um, if we do learn about living worlds out there, I could see that that's going to become much more compelling to do that. But I think we need to learn more first and, and approach it slowly. It'd be great if humanity could collectively come together and decide who speaks for Earth and what that message would be. 
I, I'm not sure I see that happening. There's a lot of science fiction stories that have been written on the subject. Um, and I'm also not sure one could argue that um, an alien species wouldn't be able to decipher such a message. But, but just knowing that somebody's there is also comforting. You know, knowing that they see us is also could be comforting in a way, um, even if we don't communicate. So I, I don't know. No. We'll see. I love the idea of the, the message in a bottle. It reminds me of the uh, the uh, uh, Sting and the Police song, Message in a Bottle, where at the end of the song, there's 100,000 bottles washed up on the shore uh, sending messages back. And so maybe we'll have 100,000 voyagers from other species coming to visit us soon. Who knows? Um, we have a question. I'm not, I'm not quite sure that I understand here. It comes from Tom Caruso on Facebook. Tom wants to know if you, if you could describe recent discoveries of super puffy mini Neptunes. Um, I've not heard that term. Uh, could you describe that more for us? Yeah. Um, I alluded to this before that the diversity of planets out there is so much larger than the diversity of planets in our, in our solar system. Um, and, and I also alluded to the fact that we have these, um, either super earths or sub neptunes they're intermediate right these in between planets well even among those in between planets there's a large diversity the masses of a uh, the mass of a sub neptune planet can range from four times the earth's mass all the way up to 20 times the earth's mass so that's a factor of 5 in difference so but but yet they can have the same radius but a factor of five difference in mass. So the, the super puffs are those that are on that low end. They have a large radius, but their mass is low. So they have very low average density, and that's puzzling. So what are they made out of? It, it suggests that they have um, high hydrogen content in relation to rock or silicates, you know, iron, magnesium, nickel, for example. Um, so maybe, well, we, we don't know. So that, that again is part of what we want to do with web. In fact, one of those super puffs is going to be observed in year one. Um, and studying the atmosphere will give a new lens on that diversity. You know, is it, uh, does it have a hydrogen rich atmosphere, for example, would help us to understand the structure of that planet. That's so awesome. Yeah, I just imagine like giant puff balls in space now. Um, but I love that so much. Um, we have a question from Arunava Padar. Um, so recently there was the announcement of a potential detection of an exoplanet in another galaxy um, from X-rays. Um, and I believe it was the transit method with the X-rays as well. Um, perhaps I'm wrong there. Um, and Arunava wants to know what the implications are for that kind of discovery of an exoplanet in another galaxy um, and whether JWST will help us to understand more about that kind of world that's that, that far away. There's no reason to think that we would have billions of planets in the Milky Way and none elsewhere, none in other galaxies. So, you know, the physics should be the same. So what, what we find here should be reflected in other galaxies. That's not a surprise. Um, but finding planets is very difficult. Planets are tiny. The, their impact on stars is very tiny. In the X-ray, it was a larger fraction, so it's easier to see. Um, and that's, that's how that methodology was capable of finding a signal uh, in another, associated with a star in another galaxy. Um, I think that there are so many planets in our own galaxy that are easier to see and to study that we'll probably spend most of our resources doing that. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think if there's strategically, uh, an advantage of observing planets in other galaxies. And I don't, it's not apparent to me why we would spend a lot of resources doing that, but it's, it's romantic, right? <laughs> to think of a, another culture or other planets in other galaxies, but, um, yeah. let's, let's figure out what's in our Milky Way first. Absolutely. Um, we have another uh, question from Reddit from user Holy Triple M. Uh, they would like to know how we'd be able to, uh, uh, what we're going to be able to find out about the atmospheres of specific exoplanets we haven't known before. Um, I think their question is specifically what more capabilities does JWST actually give us in looking at atmospheres compared to other ground based and space based telescopes? 
looking at the atmospheres of planets from the ground is really difficult. As I said, you want to go in the infrared. Um, there are, you know, our atmosphere obscures a lot of the infrared. You want to detect, for example, water features, you know, water molecules or from water vapor that could be in the atmosphere. But our own atmosphere of our planet also has water vapor, so that wreaks havoc with your observations. So it's better to do it from space. Well, I mean, it's complementary. We will do this from ground-based telescopes as well, um, but it's a little easier from space. Uh, we've done it with Hubble. Hubble has looked, has studied the atmospheres of giant planets, like these hot Jupiters, for example, um, in a very narrow range of color space, around one micron, we call it. And Webb is going to break that open and look at a very broad range of color space, also in the infrared, but extending much further out. So Hubble could see water features, but Webb will be able to see water, carbon dioxide, methane, CO, you know, there'll be many more molecules that will be available to Webb than we could do with Hubble. So that's one of the reasons why we're excited about Webb. Um, you know, people that were studying atmospheres with Hubble would look at these water features and run models to predict, okay, given this hydrogen and oxygen abundance through the water feature, what how much carbon do we expect there to be? So they have predictions already, but no access, ready access to features from molecules that actually contain carbon. Now we'll be able to do that. So we'll be able to test those models, those predictions from the observations with Hubble. So those are some examples. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, I wonder, uh, can JWST detect technosignatures? Uh, could we find potential signs of industrial gases or the, uh, similar features uh, with JWST? Yeah, great question. I, I should say from the beginning that um, for me, the distinction between biosignature and technosignature is weakening. Um, it also uh, kind of reinforces this idea that humans and nature are somehow separate and distinct, and, and they're not. So um, if we put pollutants out into the atmosphere, that's it's not a metabolic byproduct. Maybe that's the difference. When we think of biosignatures, we think of the metabolic byproducts that end up in an atmosphere, whereas a technosignature is perhaps the result of building or communicating, um, engineering. But that distinction is fuzzy as well. Um, so could we see a technosignature with Webb? Well, you're not going to get me to say no because I think that there will be a lot of surprises with Webb. But keep in mind that if you're looking for atmospheric signatures, they have to be global. We will be able to see, you know, global structures. You have to have, um, you have to have a large abundance of that molecule available in order to see it. Um, so, it so it's tricky. Um, there, there are other physical things like the physics of how these lines are created matters as well. Like, for example, we have a lot of nitrogen in our atmosphere, but nitrogen molecules N2 is very difficult to detect because it doesn't create certain strong chemical fingerprints or as strong of chemical fingerprints. So there's little subtleties that you have to worry about. But um, so I, I won't say no, but I think it's difficult. That's good to know. Um, we are running down on time, and so I want to ask one more question. And I do apologize to all of our audience who've asked so many incredible questions. I really appreciate everything. Uh, I hope you reach out to myself, to NASA Astrobiology, to Dr. Battaglia in the future, and ask more of your questions and get involved in this process. But I see that there's a question from uh, Penny Boston on YouTube that I wanted to share with you. Uh, so Penny, first says, hi, Natalie. Uh, and then Penny asks, what is, what is your personally preferred next in-space telescope project from all the various concepts that are that are competing right now? And I might even ask, um, if if someone came out tomorrow, you know, and just offered you like your, your lifetime dream mission, what would be the, the one mission you'd want to send to space if you could choose like the ultimate mission right now? So easy. I, I want a 12 meter telescope in space with star suppression technology to directly image terrestrial sized planets orbiting in the habitable zone. I want to find a couple hundred, a, a few hundred 
um, in the solar neighborhood to study so that we have a statistical sample of such planets that are potentially habitable so that we can pick out the ones that seem to stick out like a sore thumb so that we can identify what fraction of those are likely to be living worlds but also see oxygen, you know, see the tiny signature of oxygen, maybe even the red edge or you know, or, or seasonal variations. With a 12 meter to class telescope, you can also see seasonal variations or things like the glint off of water, like an ocean. Um, so, I mean, that is exactly what the Takedal survey recommended with the one distinction that it's not 12 meters. They recommended a kind of six, seven meter class telescope. So um, that's the bare minimum of what we need. I hope that in the decades that it will take to plan such a mission, because these things do take a long time, that putting such a space telescope into space uh, will become cheaper and that we'll be able to scale it up a little bit to really do a robust astrobiology search for evidence of life beyond Earth. That's my hope. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I hope to see that too. Uh, for all of our audience who are watching, if you'd like to know more about JWST, which should be launching soon, uh, you can go to jwst.nasa.gov. There's really great information there. Uh, you can go to the launch profile uh, to learn more about what happens on launch day. There's also a really beautiful uh, animation video created from NASA where you can watch uh, the process of deployment. Uh, again, JWST, it's, it's going to take some time to fully deploy, one, to its position, but also to unfurl, um, to open up for, for collecting light. And so there will be some time. Six months, actually. It's six yeah. months before we'll get the first observations. Yeah. Yeah, and so we have some time to wait, but plenty of things to be excited about as this mission gets underway and starts collecting light and starts sharing more for us to learn more about our place in the universe. Uh, for those who'd like to stay in the loop about current events with NASA Astrobiology, as well as for SaganNet, uh, you can sign up now to join the NASA Astrobiology mailing list. Uh, you should see it on your screen right now. Uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can go to astrobiology.nasa.gov. To learn more about NASA Astrobiology and to sign up again for the newsletter, uh, Dr. Battaglia, thank you so much for joining us for Ask an Astrobiologist. Thank you for having me, Graham, and thank you for all the questions from, from your listeners. I really appreciate them. They were fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for watching. Until next time, and as always, remember to stay curious. <laughs>